So, um, it's really nice to be here today. I have been here since 6 o'clock today, so I've been kind of getting antsy. We saved the sex for last, but I've definitely been getting a little antsy waiting, kind of feeling a little bit like this guy here. <laughs> Poor guy. Okay. All right, so today we're going to talk about sex, we're going to talk about libido, and we're going to define some terms. So what is sex? Good. Good. So Sue Johansson said it best when she said, sex is perfectly natural, but not naturally perfect. Sex is by its very nature ambi ambiguous and kind of confusing. Here is how the World Health Organization defines sexuality. It's a central aspect of being human throughout life and encompasses sex, gender identities and roles, sexual orientation, eroticism, pleasure, intimacy, and reproduction. So more simply put, sexuality is natural and it's healthy. It's a fundamental part of the human experience. It is physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional, it's psychological. It is most definitely connected to our sense of self-worth, our self-esteem, our ability to give and receive love and affection. And anybody take Psych 101? Everybody remember Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? Hold up your pink card if you remember him. So, okay, great, lots of people. So down at the bottom, right at the bottom of his hierarchy are your basic survival needs, like your need for food and shelter and air. And sex is right down there. It's considered a basic survival need, and it's important for us to recognize that. What sex is not. It is not just intercourse. Sometimes we tend to think about sex as only being about intercourse. And so when intercourse becomes problematic, as it does for many couples, um, other aspects of sexuality tend to go out the window as well. And that can be really unfortunate for couples. It is not a separate aspect of the person that we can just split off and say, oh, well, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. It is definitely not absent in the face of aging, illness, and disabilities. And it's certainly not adequately addressed in most, most healthcare settings. Libido. We're going to talk about libido today. Libido refers to your sex drive or your appetite for sexual intimacy. And this can be either alone or with a partner. So we are going to talk more about sexuality, sex, and libido. But before we do that, I want to get a sense of who is in the audience so we know who we're talking to. So you got your pink cards. Who is between the ages of 20 and 29? Hold up your cards. OK. Actually, quite a few. OK. 30 to 39. All right. 40 to 49. Oh, most of the group. Okay. No wonder everybody's hot in here. <laughs> 50 to 59. Oh, actually, that's a bigger group. Still hot. <laughs> 60 to 69. Okay. Any 70 to 79. Yay. Welcome. And anybody who's over the age of 80, stand up with your pink card. <laughs> oh, no. OK, we don't have any of those. Married or common law? Okay, most of the group. Single? Anybody who's single? Yay for the single ladies. Who's in a new relationship? OK, a few. And anybody widowed? Few. OK. I'm not asking if we have any children in the audience. I hope we don't. But who has children? Lots. OK. 
working, and that can be working inside the home or out, most of the group. And somebody asked this already, who gets at least seven hours of sleep a night? Excellent. Eating a healthy diet? Good. <laughs> Exercising regularly? Good. Okay, who in this crowd of mostly women who exercise regularly get enough sleep? Who likes their body? Okay. Well, look around the room. That is less than half of this, way less than half of this room, I think. And that's important to recognize because as women, when we don't feel very good about our bodies, about ourselves, it's very hard to become aroused and to help somebody else to uh, feel good about our bodies and to touch our bodies in ways that feel good to us. So that can certainly uh, interfere with positive sexuality. Okay, now that we know each other a little better, hold up your pink card if the following statement applies to you. Sometimes I have little or no libido. Wow. <laughs> really, I'm not going to share my sexual life with you. I didn't run up here to do that, right. honestly. Breaking news, folks. I want you to look in your bags, and I want you to pull out if you've got... It's a pink, a pink envelope. envelope. It is. You're looking for a pink envelope with a libido education card in it. So let me know if you've got a pink envelope. I was just talking to you guys about uh, the importance of our gene. We see a pink envelope over there. Hold it up. Hold it up, everyone. The ones that have a pink envelope. It's a libido education card. The good news, the breaking news is that uh, inside you'll find an education card and this is gonna get you a free bottle of FemMed Libido. And in it, in it, there is arginine and a number of other natural ingredients to help you with your libido. All right? So you guys go home this evening and then you enjoy that. You enjoy that FemMed Libido. <laughs> Everyone get one? I'll tell you, my own personal uh, body image is significantly decreased after having a breast exam on stage in front of you by Dr. Alvin Paddle. Right. Back to Kelly. Okay. Okay, we still have some women with their envelopes hanging up. Who still needs a bottle of libido who has a envelope? Not everybody needs one. Just hold it up if you still didn't get your bottle. Okay, so let's move on. That was not a surprise to me, not a surprise at all, because approximately half of women experience a loss of libido at some point in their lives. So this group is no different. All right, let's look at normal sex drive. What's normal sex drive? The truth is we don't really know. There is no right amount of sex that you should want or that you should be having. And women vary greatly in their desire for sex. Therefore, low sex drive is relevant, or is relative, sorry. Here we have three women and three stories. And what I'd like you to do is we're going to go through the case studies for each of these three women, and I want you to decide if you think that particular woman has low libido. And if you do, at the end of the case study, I want you to raise your pink card, if you think so. So here we have Jane. Jane is a 37-year-old married woman. She and her partner have been married for 10 years, and they have three young children. She works full-time as a corporate lawyer, and in the evenings and weekends, she is busy with her children carrying out household chores. She finds she has little time for herself and often feels tired and run down. She loves her partner and they previously enjoyed an active sex life, but now she would rather sleep than have sex. They have sex approximately twice per month. Does she have low sex drive? Pink card up. Anybody know Jane? <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, I think she does. Here's Sharon. Sharon's 61 years old. She's retired, and she's been happily married for 35 years. She and her partner, who's also retired, enjoy playing golf, traveling, and spending time with their grandchildren. The couple's sex life has gone through many changes and transitions over the years. Sharon has found a personal lubricant that relieves her vaginal dryness and makes intercourse pleasurable. Her husband takes Viagra to help him achieve firm erections. The couple has intercourse approximately twice per month and both are happy with this frequency. Does she have low libido? No. Nothing wrong with her libido. Now we have Linda. I like Linda. She's a 31-year-old event planner who has been living common law with her partner for the past three years. She enjoys her job, works out regularly, and is in good general health. Lately, she finds that her attraction to her partner is declining. She says her partner has become a couch potato, and they seem to have little to talk about. She finds herself fantasizing about other people that she meets at her events, and she masturbates almost daily to these fantasies. She and her partner have sex approximately twice per month. Anything wrong with her libido? Nope. Okay, so we had three women having sex approximately twice per month. Only one of them, this audience, identified as having low libido, and I think you would be correct. So it has little or nothing, sometimes nothing, to do with the frequency with which we are having sex. It has more to do with our subjective experience of the sex that we're having or the sex that we are not having. In medical terms, low desire is referred to as hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and it consists of persistent or recurrent lack of sexual fantasies, thoughts, and or interest in sexual activity that causes personal distress. And it's that personal distress that is the important piece here. So here are some causes of low libido. A woman's libido is influenced by a complex interaction of many components. We've talked many times tonight about how complex we are as women. So our physical health, our psychological and our emotional health, and many physical illnesses and mental illnesses as well can cause sexual difficulties, ranging from desire difficulties to orgasmic difficulties, um, to even difficulties penetrating, having intercourse. The problem, or one of the problems, is that often the medications that are used to treat these illnesses tend to cause sometimes even more problems with, with sexuality and sexual intimacy. So that's a big problem. Uh, personal experiences and beliefs. So if you've had negative experiences or you've grown up with beliefs that, uh, for example, sex is dirty or sex is wrong, or sex is only for procreation, I hear that a lot. It's very difficult for, for women who have grown up with those kinds of beliefs to then feel free in their sexual interactions with their partners. Lifestyle, so we've already spoken a lot about lifestyle, uh, not getting enough exercise, not enough sleep, uh, poor nutrition and high stress can definitely interfere with sex drive. And relationship issues. So if you're having difficulties in your relationship with your partner, it can't help but to filter down into your sex life. Okay, give me some F words for sex. Throw them out. Fun. Fun. Fantastic. All right, nobody's saying the one that I'm looking for. Okay. So positive sexual functioning depends on these five Fs. It can be fun and fantastic and other things. But in order to have a positive sexual functioning, you need to have these. You need to have friction, which is effective sensory stimulation. There need to, needs to be the presence of positive feelings, not only about yourself, but also about your partner. Freedom, freedom from attitudes and behaviors that produce anxiety and negative feelings. Fantasy. So that's the ability to bring our thoughts to an erotic level. And women often have a lot of difficulty this, with this piece. We come home at the end of the day, we got to do the laundry, we got to make the lunches, we need to pay the bills, we need to do a whole bunch of things. And for most of us, sex, if it's going to happen at all, 
happens at the end of all that. It's like today, we save the sex for last. We tend to do that in our lives as well. And then what happens? Too tired, way too tired. And it's very difficult for women at that point to focus on bringing their thoughts to an erotic level and getting into sex. So they tend to go to sleep. Focus, positively focused meanings attributed to sexuality and sexual behavior. So when women come into my office and they tell me that they're not having sex or they're complaining that they have no libido or low libido, I like to ask them to tell me about the kind of sex that they don't want to have. Because I get a lot of information about what they're feeling about the sex that they're having or they're not having, how it feels physically and emotionally. And the truth is, we are unlikely to desire something if it doesn't make us feel good. Looking at the physiology of sexual response. So your sexual response is All right. All right. Am I on now? I'm on now. Okay. So hormones, nerves, blood supply, and stimulation. And the stimulation is both psychological stimulation and physical stimulation. And the truth is, if there are problems or deficiencies in any of these symptoms, that can negatively affect our ability to have pleasurable sex. So for example, if we look at stimulation, if stimulation is inadequate or not pleasurable, a woman is unlikely to produce enough lubrication. She doesn't have enough lubrication, what happens? It hurts, right? It becomes painful, uncomfortable, and if women are having sex that's prolonged, that continues to be painful and uncomfortable, what happens? Irritations, sometimes infections, bladder infections, vaginal infections, and over time, having sex like this, women tend to fear it sometimes and often avoid it. And once again, if you're not having pleasurable sex, it's going to affect your interest in having sex. So it's quite complicated. Okay, true or false? Get out your cards. Pink is true. Green is false. How am I doing for time? We okay? Ten minutes? Okay, well, we already know this. Testosterone is a hormone found only in men. False. Well, we already know this. We told you this. All right, that's false. In women, testosterone tends to be our primary desire hormone. Greater than 80% of women masturbate. Oh, quite a mixed response. <laughs> Looks like about half and half. That is true. And just like we have a mixture of married, not married, young, older women, that's true for masturbation as well. I like to call it self-pleasuring. It has a nicer ring to it. That, you know. And it, it signifies that it's normal and it's healthy. And what it can help to do is help you to get to know your own body, what you like what feels good, what doesn't feel good. Because the truth is, it's really hard to help somebody else, a partner, to understand what we like if we don't really know ourselves. And that becomes even harder if you're in a relationship with somebody who doesn't have the same anatomy and has to try and figure out what's going to feel good for you. So self-pleasuring can help you to figure that out. Most women are brought to orgasm by the stimulation of an erect penis inside the vagina. <laughs> Does anybody in this audience think that is true? <laughs> no. Okay, right. It's false. It's absolutely false. 
And it's false because, as everybody in this audience seems to know, most women require direct clitoral stimulation in order to reach orgasm. So here we have a little uh, one of those things that you see on TV, viewer discretion advised. The next couple slides are like five feet vaginas. So just <laughs> get ready. Here we go. Wow. <laughs> OK. How do we work this thing? Oh, wrong way. OK. So here's the vagina, right in here. The clitoris is over here. And there's actually a fair bit of distance between the vaginal opening and the clitoris. So here I have my wooden penis. I don't go anywhere without it. So if this represents the vagina, this hole here, and this knuckle represents the clitoris, this is what's happening when we're having intercourse. Miss every time. Nothing. There's absolutely nothing happening on the clitoris, right? And in certain positions, there's even less happening over there. So it's no wonder that during intercourse, straight penis and vagina intercourse, not a lot's happening for the woman. However, if we look at changing our positioning, a woman can actually maneuver her pelvis so that she's getting some stimulation on her clitoris. And some of these are really funky positions. I'm not, I'm not advising any of them. It's a couple two on one, three on one. I'll just let you maul that over a little bit. Come on. Wow. Well, what about that? OK. Okay, let's calm it down, calm it down. We'll go back to true or true false. Size matters. <laughs> oh, oh <my> God. <laughs> Some of you are changing your mind. <laughs> no, it's false. It's false. And the reason it is false is because there are actually very few nerve endings high up in the vagina. It's about the first couple of knuckles that you have a lot of experience in there. After that, you don't feel a whole lot. Um, what That's good. So actually, that brings me to my next point, which is not to say that many women don't very much enjoy the feeling of having a penis, a toy, a hand, something in the vagina. It helps them to feel more filled up, and it's quite a pleasurable experience. But it's only about 20% of us who have orgasms through intercourse alone, or something in the vagina alone, without there being some kind of stimulation on the clitoris as well. OK, true or false? Women can have multiple orgasms. OK, it's true. But the truth, of the, the truth of the matter is most of us don't. Some women do, and we can, because we don't have what's called a refractory period. Men have this thing called a refractory, re refractory period, which is the time necessary to attain a subsequent erection after they've had an initial erection and an orgasm. We don't have such a thing. But most of us just have had enough after one <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> And so we don't need the refractory period. We just want to go to sleep. <laughs> 50% of 
Physical and emotional changes associated with menopause can affect libido. Well, we've already talked about that, right? But I love this slide. Itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated. So clearly the author or the illustrator forgot horny in that slide. Lots of good reasons why women who are struggling with menopause also struggle with their, their desire. Okay, but there's lots we can do to take control over our libidos. One is to consult your medical or your naturopathic professional. And this can help us to look at underlying illnesses that may be contributing to our difficulties with sexuality, blood work and laboratory tests, any other diagnostic procedures, get an evaluation of current medications that you may be on that may be further contributing to the difficulties. And as we've already talked about, and a lucky 25 of you now have a libido supplement. Many women have found that taking such a supplement, a libido supplement, can help to um, enhance their stimulation, enhance the arousal effect, and in turn uh, enhance sex drive. And there can be other supplements such as menopause supplement, um, PMS supplement, uh, sleep, energy, many other supplements that aren't specific li to libido can help to improve libido as well. Get to know your body sexually. So that's that self-pleasuring that I was talking about. Experiment with sex toys. And I have a whole bunch of sex toys here. I'm really hoping that somebody is going to ask me a question about sex toys because I got some to show you. But I'll save that. So hint, hint, somebody asked me a question about sex toys. Uh, Water-based lubricant. So lubricants are for everybody. It's not just for women who are struggling with vaginal dryness. That extra slipperiness that uh, we get from a lubricant can really create a positive feedback loop. So our vagina says, oh, this is really slippery. This is really nice. That message goes to our brain, which, by the way, happens to be the largest sex hormone or sex organ, rather, in our body. The brain thinks, oh, I'm turned on, produces more lubrication, and we're having a really nice time. <laughs> Other things we can do, adjust your lifestyle. Try and get some more exercise. Do what you can to get more sleep. Take a course in stress management. Do yoga. Do mindfulness meditation. Strengthening your pelvic muscles can do a lot for your uh, sexual stimulation. It helps to strengthen those muscles and um, creates more, more um, stimulation. It can also enhance orgasms. Talk. Talk to your partners. Talk to your doctors. Talk to your naturopath. Talk to your girlfriends. Talk to your boyfriends. Get it out there. Addressing relationship issues. I always encourage my couples that I meet with to plan dates, to go on dates like they did when they first started getting together, and um, to include intimacy on those dates. So make a date to be intimate. And sometimes couples will say to me, oh, it's not spontaneous. Well, the hell with spontaneity. <laughs> like, what do you, once you've got lives, busy lives, perhaps kids, busy jobs, lot, spontaneity kind of goes out the window, and we just have to recognize that and plan to be intimate. And by the way, what's really spontaneous about the sex that we used to have when we were younger and used to go on dates? Like you get dressed, right? You, you take a shower, you get dressed, maybe you put on a little cologne or perfume, you do your hair, you go out to a nice movie, maybe you have a glass of wine, and then you come home and you spontaneously have sex. Like what <laughs> is spontaneous about that? So we are talking about just getting back to planning to be sexual so that you can get your head into it. Um, <laughs> there we go. This is a quick group. 
addressing problem areas in the relationship, and for some couples, it's very helpful to seek counseling. Thank you very much.